Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very special episode of Esoteric Atlanta with my good friend, Cindy. You guys know her. She's been on the channel before, and this is probably the most requested video I've had so far. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to put one out myself of over this topic because of all the other research I've had to do. So I'm so grateful that Cindy is here today for us to take a deep, deep dive into the energetic body as we move into this new awakening this new timeline if you will so many people are starting to realize that deep inside in our spirit we've had the power all along to understand things not to sound like the wizard of oz or anything but we have had the power all along with inside of us and so you guys have requested a lot for me to go over some of these things with you guys and cindy is the expert she owns sacred garden yoga in marietta georgia where i teach on sunday mornings she just finished teaching a class believe it or not because she looks gorgeous i don't look that good when i'm done teaching but cindy does and um and yeah we got you got some workshops and stuff coming up that we're going to put down in the description box below as well and i know that people can contact you through zoom too right for yes. appointments and stuff Perfect. Yeah, I absolutely do stuff through Zoom, obviously here if you're local in the yoga studio, but yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, let's go ahead and get started, Cindy. Now, we will get to the chakras, guys. Don't worry. But I think for starters, we are going to talk about um, intuition and gut feeling and trauma and fear and how to not confuse the two. Do you want to get started on that and explaining that to people? Absolutely. The intuition, I feel, is the voice of our higher self, the voice of our soul. And it's usually going to lead us, or not usually, pretty much always going to lead us in the direction of our highest success, mm -hmm. not just for ourselves, but also for our family and the work with, that we do and the, the community that we belong to. Um, but it is very easy to confuse the void, that voice, because we have so many other voices that go on in our head um, with the one, the true voice of your, your heart, your intuition, intuition, your sacred self, um, your higher self, your Holy Spirit, whatever word that you want to call your connection with something that's bigger than you, but it's also inside of you. What you said was totally correct is that the power is inside of us that we have the capacity to tap it into, um, I mean, the energy inside of us is huge. It's humongous already. You know, some people feel like they need to tap into energy outside of yourself, which you can find some, mm -hmm. some good, interesting, funky stuff out there as well. But as the, the saying goes, as above, so below. You have that same wisdom inside of you as well. It just depends on what, what uh, what path you want to take. Sometimes at first we delve within the framework of the cosmos and try to understand that to be able to understand ourselves better. But in the end, it's, um, it's going to take you back to here. Yeah. And the understanding that you are actually a fractal of the universe, a fractal meaning that you are a complete piece of the universe. And so you hold all the wisdom that you need. Um, so your intuition uh, directs you to that communication within your body because your intuition co communicates with you through your body. It has to, as long as we're in the incarnation and in form. Right. Mm -hmm. But since we are in a human body and in form, we also have things like fear and uh, trauma responses because of experiences that we've been through, not just in this lifetime, but in previous lifetimes as well, if that's something that you believe in, that holds within, um, within the body. It holds within the cellular structure of our body. And that fear can come through just as powerfully, if not more powerfully, sometimes in our intuition. And then it's a matter of, okay, how can I tell the difference, which is what we're, we're talking about, what we're wanting to talk about here. Um, the intuition is, um, again, it's the, it's the voice of the higher part of you. And everyone experiences it differently. Everyone experiences intuition differently. So I would say, first of all, is get in tune with how you 
experience your intuition the most. We were talking about um, before this, the, the clairs, the different clairs, the clair senses. Yeah. Right. Be, and the, the, the clairs are for the one that we're most common. Um, well, we, mo we know the most about is the clairvoyance, like being able to see. And you have others as well. You have clear audience which is the ability to hear beyond it. I'm talking about being able to see beyond just what you see, like I see this tree or I see this fence, but also being able to perceive and see like energy and mm -hmm. vibrations and things like that. Uh, the other one is uh, clear audience. There's also clear sentience feeling, which is me. I'm a feeler. <laughs> There is clear aliens, that's your nose being able to smell. The stance is taste and the cognizance is knowing. That's an, the, my two big ones are I sense, like I feel and I know. It's just suddenly I know something and then I know it and I, and I know it's true. Yeah. And the mm -hmm. smelling thing we talked before, it's like you hear people say all the time, they'll smell a scent that was like their grandmother. Or like mm -hmm. they'll smell cigar smoke that's not around them, but their grandfather smoked cigars or their grandmother's perfume, but it's not really there. But it's it's a it's a it's a smell that other people are not going to smell. But if you have that ability, mm -hmm. you're going to pick up on that. And that's pretty I mean, they're all actually I know clairvoyance is probably the most common, but it's interesting because you were saying and I believe this, that we all have one of at least one of these. Right. There's at least one thing that everyone's going to have to be able to see what's not necessarily there, but it's it's to connect to that inner understanding, if that makes sense. Yeah, and the, you actually probably have the capacity for all of them, I think we all do, but there's gonna be some that come in more strongly than others. Like some people are gonna be natural. I'm, I believe I'm not like a huge seer. I see things in my mind's eye. Right. Like in, through my imagination, if I'm working on, energetically on people, I might get images. So maybe that's the way the clairvoyance comes in through me. Mm -hmm. But then there are some people who very clearly see like auras. They see yeah. auras around people or, or they see entities or beings that have already passed on. You know, they see the aura around trees. Um, uh, and that's, you know, that's a pretty, pretty cool one to have for sure. But if you don't have that, it doesn't mean that you're not intuitive, though. Right. It means that it might be coming through through you in a different kind of a way. And I think that the universe, the higher creator, God, whatever you name, you call that that being is one of love. And so sometimes the ability we're given is the one that isn't going to freak us out the most, if that makes sense, because yes. for some people seeing something that's going to terrify them. And so, and you, and, but you do see it with kids. How many stories do we see of kids, like videos of them in, in their crib and they're like chit chatting with something that's not even there that we can't mm -hmm. see. Right. But then we grow up and we lose that because we kind of get disconnected and discombobulated from, from that intuitive understanding that we're born with. Yeah, well, it's because, um, uh, especially when we grew up, it wasn't necessarily encouraged for us to develop that part of ourselves. So it does get shut down, or it doesn't get fully developed or cultivated until maybe later on in your years, and you decide that you want to, to fully develop it again. That, that makes a, a big difference. We can very easily shut them down, because at some point, again, it wasn't, it was discouraged. Wasn't or accepted. It yeah. wasn't accepted or you were belittled or made fun of or something like that because of it. And all that, um, your, your clairs are sensitive to how you feel about them. Right. That makes sense. So oh, it's easy to, to shut them down. And then we do get disconnected. And right now where we're at the age where we have so much information coming at us, from so many different points of view, mm -hmm. you know, it's time for us to, be, uh, to wake that up so that we can hear from the voice of the, the place that's going to guide us again to, uh, to our highest, to our highest success and to, you know, to our abundance and to our health and to just being, being supported in this world. Um, with so much information coming at us now, uh, I think it's so important to be able to develop this intuitive part of you. 
Um, so one way is uh, to begin to recognize where your how your intuition works through you specifically. So what would be an example of someone figuring that out? Would they just start, have to like start observing their set themselves in moments of quiet or yes, you can pay attention? Yeah, pay attention. You can uh, sit quietly, close your eyes, tune in with yourself, ask. I mean, all you have to do most of the time is ask. Just sure. ask. You have so many powers that be in, in spirit and angel guides that are waiting for you to ask <laughs> and to open yourself up to them. And you sit and ask and they're like, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Something to do that's so funny. There's even a verse in the Bible asking you shall receive, yes. you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Like it's all there. And it's so funny you say that because we have been on this channel, like trying to like break through the truth of everything. And I've been trying to figure out like what planets really are because we know that what we've been told might not be accurate. So, like, what are what are planets? What are these messengers? And I've been asking all these people, and no one can really answer me. And I was just recording the other day part three of our, our, our apocalypse of Abraham from our missing book of the Bible. And it flat out tells you, and, and I was like, I started laughing reading and I was like, Oh my God, there it is. Yes. <laughs> so it's true. It's true. They're, they're waiting for you to ask these questions. You, yeah. you have to ask though, but you do have to ask because they're not going to force themselves upon your, your free will. Right. Um, so asking, uh, for more clarity, for more guidance and how you uh, experience the voice of or the communication of your higher self. Mm -hmm. um, close your eyes. You can practice it, make that connection. And you can, um, once you close your eyes and center yourself, open your eyes and notice what pops out. Like look around you. Does the vision pop out for you the most or do you suddenly get a whiff of something? These are small little practices that you can do to begin to understand this part of yourself. And then it's a matter of, you know, uh, continually developing that. Right. Now, what is, so we, we talked a little bit, and I know Tamara comes on the channel too. She always says, you know, the difference between fear and your gut intuition is that fear makes sense where the gut intuition doesn't make sense all of the time. But for people who don't understand, and I think sometimes for me and Cindy, you might be the same way. I think I forget because we work in the yoga world. We're constantly working with like trauma in the body and trauma responses. When we say trauma response, I want people watching to understand this doesn't necessarily mean something big and bad that happened to you. This could be something very, very minimal that you might not even remember, but your body has recorded. So can you explain to people like in layman's term, what is a trauma response? And do you believe that we all have it? We all have certain trauma responses. If you're in human form, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you're yeah. in human form and then if you lived on earth, on planet for if even a minuscule amount of time, most likely you've gotten inoculated with something that can very well be uh, uh, created a, a kind of fear or trauma response within you. Mm -hmm. um, your body absolutely remembers everything. I kind of see it as like this mini Akashic record. It's right. like your Akashic records. An Akashic record is basically... Um, like uh, if you if you if you think of the Akashic record, the, the big Akashic records, it pretty much stores all the information of the whole entire universe and the history of the planets and all that stuff. Well, I think our body is an Akashic record, too. At least I feel that. And especially with our own experiences. And again, not just from this incarnation in this body, but also from past lives and also ancestral. Absolutely. In other words, yeah. what your, your grandparents or your great grandparents or, you know, goes way back when it, your body holds the history and the, the remembrance of all that. So a trauma response can, um, it's not only from this lifetime in this body, but it also carries over from other, other experience, other lifetimes and other family members. Right. And it basically, um, uh, let's say something, and, and you're right, it doesn't have to be a huge thing, especially, well, let's just say if you're a child, 
for a child to get uh, fearful, it doesn't necessarily take a whole lot. Right. It might take more as an adult because you've developed that part of yourself, but a, a child who isn't fully, you know, cognitively developed, they don't understand the world um, mm-hmm. in the same way that an adult does, which it can be a good thing, but it can also be um, it, uh, the children are more like sponges that way. Right. Let's put it that way. And the children also take just a, if you have a child, you know, this, they'll take anything personally. They take everything personally. Um, and he, cause they, they don't know any better yet. I can't remember what the age is before they're really able to differentiate and right. say that the world doesn't revolve around me, but children really do. Yeah. I mean, they really do think that the world yeah. revolves around them. Yeah. And if something negative happens in any way, it, they'll take it personally, they'll, they'll internalize it in some way. And that that could be a big thing, or it could be a small little thing. Again, that might not be that big of a deal to an adult, but it can be a very big deal to a child. And then we develop an idea about that. In other words, let's say we do something, you know, and it, 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 let's just take the example of a child. You know, of, a, of, a, of a trauma response that would have been cultivated, let's say, within this lifetime, within this body. You were a child and you, you did something like you were singing and dancing and prancing around and you were all free and happy. But then uh, um, your parents, who might have not been in a very good mood at that point, tells you, you know, shut up, be quiet. You're... Um, you're making too much noise or you're causing too much commotion. A single response like that can shut down that part of yourself. Well, that says, oh my gosh, well, I shouldn't sing. I shouldn't be free. I shouldn't dance. I shouldn't twirl around because if I do that, it's not acceptable. Right. So it's and a then that, thing. Yeah. That then, the stress response. Exactly. And then that creates uh, like a shutting down in a way of that part of yourself. And then that also creates a whole belief system. Mm -hmm. It'll create a whole uh, thought construct that says, don't do that anymore. Because if you do that, then you're going to get in trouble or you're going to be made fun of or or, uh, whatever words that you pick. Right. And then that thought process becomes a program that runs in your mind. And you didn't even like, you know, you might not, as an adult, you look back, you might not even remember that you made that. I was that about to say, system. yeah. But, the, but the, in, the information is still there. The emotional memory is still there. And I do, uh-huh. I think so many grown, I mean, they say that you spend your adult life trying to get over your childhood, but I think so, a lot of adults have those type of situations that have created a certain behavior that they don't even remember. And as, as an adult, you can look back at a situation like that and be like, oh yeah, my parent was in a bad mood that day. It had nothing to do with me. But as a kid, you don't, that doesn't, that doesn't yes. register. And so you it's take it personally. Yeah. yeah. You take it personally. Cause that's the only thing that you know how to do. You did something wrong. And um, since you did something wrong and we're usually wanting to please the, our adults or our parents we change, we'll change our behavior, but then that emotion um, also, you know, you create that, that construct and then that emotion um, can get frozen in time almost. Like if it hurt your feelings and uh, children also don't, aren't very good always at processing their emotions, unless you just let them rage. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like a child who just, ah, you know, kind of rages and, and, and lets it out, that helps to release the response from the body. Right. But again, um, children aren't taught to uh, just let their emotions be. We usually tell them, well, you have to suppress them or you need to not make them so wild or crazy because it, it's... Um, Again, it's not acceptable. Not culturally acceptable, yeah. It's not cool. I mean, not that they should be raging in the middle of the grocery store necessarily, but I mean, a child will naturally have a response to want to release. Yeah. But we don't, um, again, that's not necessarily encouraged either. Right. So you have something happened, something traumatic. And again, it can just be something small that happens. 
and then you aren't given the, the, um, the ability to process that emotion, you'll create a whole thought process, a whole thought construct around it. And if the emotion isn't fully processed, you can also hold that within your body. And it doesn't disappear. <laughs> That's another thing. All it does is it suppresses and it gets stuck in places within your body, but it doesn't ever just disappear. That's what we wish that it would do. Yeah, that it would just completely go away. We never have to deal with it again. But unfortunately, since your body is a, a, like a, it stores everything, it's going to hold it for you. But in a, it, it, but it's doing it on purpose because, in essence, your your higher self wants you to be whole again, and it right. wants you to be able to come back again and to reclaim those parts of you that you might have stuffed away or tucked away somewhere or emotion that's stuck or frozen in your body, so that it can release and and you can feel whole again. But it's not going to your higher self is never going to like just take pieces away from you. Right. You can fragment them yourself. Yeah, that, that, yeah that's all you. That's not your higher self. That's all you. <laughs> yes, you fragment it yourself, but it's still contained within the framework of your, of your body, your heart, your soul, your energetic body, if that makes sense. So with trauma responses, what tends to happen is regardless of whether the trauma again was big and y'all know what we're talking about. We have to be careful on YouTube because of censorship, but we know what big traumas are. Y'all know that. But then the small traumas is that these patterns that from this, this story we've created around this then start to kind of dictate how we yes. behave in the world, which is what you're talking about. Understanding the difference between this fear response or trauma response versus the actual intuition response, which is not a part of the fear response. Mm -hmm. So, well, you, and then the, your the trauma, your fear response, it's um, it starts to make up like this egoic part of you mm -hmm. that wants to keep you safe. It wants to keep right. you protected and safe, which it, it, you know it's not. That's not a bad thing. Right. So when we're starting to go back in and um, understand. Uh, like the traumas and the fears within us, we want to go in compassionately and understanding that they're actually, they were designed to protect us and, and to keep us feeling safe. But the, the problem with that is that it will keep you in the same little box where it's hard for you to grow out of that. And the, the, um, when you do want to grow out of that box, let's say you get an intuitive hit that says to, oh, you know, go start this YouTube channel mm -hmm. or go, uh, go uh, offer that workshop or that class that you want to do or, you know, start your, um, I don't know, your Instagram or what, whatever the, that thing is, especially something that really puts you out there and mm -hmm. gets you out there in, in front of people, mm -hmm. your intuition, you'll, you'll get a hit from your intuition and it, it will feel good and it will feel fresh. And by the way, that's one of the ways that you can tell the difference between an intuitive and a fear response is your intuition will be anchored in the present moment. It will say, Oh yeah, go do this right now. Right. And then uh, a lot of times what will happen is you'll get this idea, this moment of inspiration and revelation that can break you out of this small little box that you've, you've, uh, you've put yourself in. And uh, a short while later, the fear response will come in and say, oh my gosh, no, don't start that YouTube channel because then all these people are going to see you mm -hmm. and they're going to think you're completely crazy and they're going to think you're nuts. And that's danger. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that that responds or it, um, it interprets through the body and through your mind as dangerous. Right. And because that's dangerous, it will, that fear, it, it, it'll trigger, it'll, it, um, it triggers your, physically your central nervous system. Yep. Where you might get sweaty and you get anxious and um, yeah, your central nervous system starts to turn on all these hormonal responses that say danger, 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 danger. Yeah. It, I mean, that's what it really feels like. It feels like danger. 
Yeah. Some and people start shaking then too. We like, listen shaking. to the danger. Yeah. We think, oh my, you know, I shouldn't do this. And that danger then, or that fear, that danger overrides your intuition. Yeah. That's such a good example. Yeah. And fear will, uh, as I said, the intuition will be uh, more present based. In other words, it says, oh my, do this thing now where a fear response or a trauma response will usually be anchored somewhere in the past. Yeah. Because it, it is remembering your fear or your body is remembering something from the past that was dangerous or that didn't feel good or that caused you angst or caused you some hurt and some suffering. It remembers that it's like it reaches in and it remembers and then it starts to send off all those signals to shut down. Yeah. And so, I think everybody listening can relate to what Cindy just said that where you, you're in, you feel inspired and then you feel defeated by your own thought process. Exactly. Um, and, and that, that I love that. Cause that, that is definitely, it's almost like your fear response will try to talk you off the ledge but you're not even on the ledge to begin with. Yeah. And that's where it can get very confusing for a person because you think, oh, well, it is. It's like my fear is just trying to, it, it's trying, it's really uh, trying to help you to protect you, mm -hmm. but it doesn't realize that it's also sabotaging you. Y'all know that self-sabotage, that's a big word. <laughs> yes. One of the, the human body is interesting too. And I have to be careful how, how I say this. So We'd see this a lot with, we'll just use women for an example, since we're two women, like everybody's got that friend or knows that person that keeps dating the wrong guy, like <laughs> AB, USC relationships, and they get into one, they get to, uh, they keep repeating these patterns of going. And I know that a lot of times trauma, if you've experienced trauma, the body will also try to relive that trauma so that you can actually deal with it. And exactly. So you see so that like happening. A karmic. Yeah. A karmic pattern. A repetition, yeah. and you might think, "Oh my gosh, well, God is punishing me, or the universe is punishing me. This mm -hmm. is terrible. I can't figure things out." But the it's repeating because you're repeating. Yes, yeah. you know, it's not the world that isn't punishing you. It's trying to show you, well, this is repeating because you're repeating. You're, yeah. You haven't broken past this thought pattern or this belief system that you have about yourself, maybe not being worthy of, of love. If you're talking about like, an, you know, you said an abusive situation. These are just, just some examples. Right. But if you have a, a, a repetitive thing going on within your, your subconscious, because a lot of times it is subconscious right because consciously none of us ask to be abused no i mean who would you know consciously we don't we don't ask for those kind of things right but uh subconsciously we might have these programs running saying that um yeah like you're not worthy of that kind of love you're only worthy of this kind of love and the repetition is happening so it it, it doesn't it's like i think pima chaldron uh, said, uh, nothing ever goes away until you, um, until it teaches you what you need to learn. Mm -hmm. In other words, it, it will repeat until you finally integrate the teaching or the learning, or, you know, you break that, that's that cycle. Right. And sometimes again, it's, it's subconscious. It's from fragments within your, your soul, not, not your, your soul can't be fragmented, but fragments within your energetic your psyche. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Fragments within your psyche. Yeah. Yeah. And, and sometimes it takes that realization. Sometimes, you know, we, we do have to make the same mistake over and over again before we realize, we realize what that, what that pattern is. And I, I did that myself. I dated terrible guys over and over mm -hmm. again until the last one that was awful. And I literally, before my first trip to India, and I literally just focused on when I was in India that first time on healing and really focused on myself. And I came back and that's when uh, Todd and I got together and he is, it's the most, it's like one of the healthiest relationships I've ever been in. So mm -hmm. it, it, there is, there needs to sometimes be this realization that happens where you do start to observe and realize the idea of a trauma response and a, like a broken record, a samskara that's happening over yeah. there versus who you really are. I always tell people in yoga, like the whole idea of uh, is realizing that who you think you really are 
isn't actually who you really are. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the whole purpose of yoga and a lot of spiritual healings is like, first of all, realizing that, that you're not, the ideas that you have, the story about yourself you have isn't normally the truth. No, there are personalities just that are, again, based off of, again, thoughts and belief patterns that uh, were developed out of times of, of fear or of as times of feeling yeah. diminished or, uh, at, you know, times of suffering and we don't want to repeat the suffering. Right. Um, and you're, the one thing I think it's important, too, that when we start to go through our healing process and we go through the cycle, we're repeating stuff. And sometimes we can beat ourselves up and mm -hmm. say, oh, my gosh, why can't I figure this out? And then we get really angry at ourselves. That's not helpful either. That's just creating a new trauma response. <laughs> That's just creating another layer of crap on top of the crap that is already there. Um, so beating yourself up or, or, or bullying yourself because you can't figure something out is not the way to go. But we I mean, do that. We I know. think that to ourselves, especially in the spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. We and think that we're broken. And the thing is, is that you're not like in oh. the essence, in the heart of you, in the spirit of you, you're not broken at all. You're just having like this momentary lapse of forgetfulness. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Alan what it talks is. about that a lot. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's uh yeah, no, totally. I mean, what's you're right, because in, in the yoga world, especially you do see people kind of like bully themselves. And it's so funny because the first rule of yoga is ahimsa, which mm -hmm. is non-violence. You know, he didn't, Tanjali didn't pick peace. He picked non-violence because you know that that you're going to have that reaction to kind of like bully yourself, but you have to be able to be aware of that and choose not to. You know, most of us speak to our, the way we speak to ourselves, for most of us, the way we speak to ourselves is a way we would never speak to anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's a realization in itself is when you become your own worst enemy and to be able to have that compassion for yourself and understand that you are whole, but you have to work to find that, you know, and, and, and to kind of sweep your house up a little bit, you know? Um, well, I will say too, just to, um, to, to, um, cause this also goes in really well to one of the ways that you can tell the difference between an intuitive response and a fear response, an intuitive hit will not be bullying. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it won't be shame based. It won't play on your shame. It won't play on guilt. It won't bully you. And it won't play on any feelings of desperation. Right. Sometimes we'll, we'll confuse that and we'll hear a voice that says, oh, no, 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 don't do that. But the, um, the tone, the feeling tone of that voice might be extreme guilt or shame. Mm -hmm. so that um, comes up a lot maybe with money. <laughs> we'll I can feel see. guilty, especially... Uh, you know, people that are more in the spiritual realm, um, you know, talking about having crazy fear and, and, um, and, and not a very he healthy relationship with like abundance and money, especially uh, people who've been on, on this path. We have right. this crazy relationship and idea with money and maybe you, you want to offer a service and you want to charge some money for it. And then a guilt response mm -hmm. comes in and says, no, you can't charge that. But there's an undertone of guilt. That is not your intuition. Yeah. That is a guilt framework that you're working within or a shame framework. Yeah. I, I think because, you know, it's so funny because in India, um, my teacher in India is one of the wealthiest people in South, South India, you know, and my boyfriend will tell stories of Patabi Joyce, who was his teacher, who's passed away, that if it was time for you to pay tuition, like even if you were like 50 rupees short, you had to go home and get that 50 rupees, mm -hmm. you know, and we do in the West, for some reason, we, we have this like romantic idea of being like, you know, committed to a life of poverty because we're spiritual teachers, but 
you know, that there is an energy exchange when you're helping someone, you're working with somebody, you're teaching someone, you're giving them your energy Mm -hmm. and you can't give energy without being replenished. And that tuition back or that payment for your service back is that replenishment for your energy. And yeah, I totally get that. Cause you see that all the time, especially in the yoga world that people feel like they have to like you know, only do donation based stuff and donation based stuff is fine too. There are some people mm-hmm. that just do certain classes that are donation based, but yeah, I absolutely understand what you're saying. Cause we immediately yeah. associate money with capitalism and people have a very extreme view on that. And it's like, no, there's shades of gray there. No, oh, yeah. absolutely. It's yeah, definitely shades of gray. It's not like one extreme or the other or the other. Right. But yeah. Right. So your intuition will play on guilt. If you're, if you get a thought, and there's guilt or there's shame or there's a sense of you being diminished. It won't play on your desperation either or your um, naivete, mm-hmm. if, if, you, uh, if that makes sense. And I think this is a really important piece that it's not going to play on your desperation, um, especially when it comes to uh, who you listen to. Uh, this is the part of your intuition that's going to keep you from being involved in something like a bad cult or something like that. Yeah. Because uh, your, your desperation might take you down that path. That's a good point. Desperation is not your intuition either. Do you see what I mean? So your right. intuition is not going to play on, on that part of yourself. And that is usually when we're praying the most. Too. Usually we're praying when we're desperate, mm-hmm. we're praying when our world far, falls apart and we're in that dark night of the soul experience. Mm-hmm. And it's not to say that your intuitive voice won't come in at that point. It very much will, but it's, it will have, I think, a different feeling right. versus, um, versus like making a, a decision um, mainly just on desperation. And then that will go, that goes into another point of the difference between intuition and trauma response is your intuition um, is usually non-emotional. So you might be in a strongly, you know, dark night of the soul kind of a place, but your intuition will still come through more clear. Right. Not going to come with a strong, strong emotion attached to it. Right. That makes sense. Like fear will come with a strong, like (gasps) that, you know, that, that that anxious feeling sometimes to it. Um, But your intuition won't. Now your intuition might, the voice, sometimes it can be soft, but sometimes it can be loud. Right. Depending on the situation and, and how, you know, how it's trying to get your attention but it won't come with super strong emotions Mm -hmm. unless, unless you are actually in current danger, like you're being chased by a bear. Right. (laughs) If you're being chased by a bear and your body's like, holy shit, run. (laughs) You're just going to yell at you at that point. (laughs) Yeah. You run. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's funny you talk about like when people are in a dark night of the soul and they're very vulnerable and they're high emotion at that point. And you talk about like high control groups. It seems too in that fear response where instead of when we're attracted to those groups and that vulnerable, we're looking for something outside of ourselves to save us versus sitting quietly in in that uncomfortable place, in that place of vulnerability, anger, sadness, whatever, and just being able to like breathe and try to listen to that part of you that 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 only thing that's going to save you is, is yes, this, you know, and so and it's crazy because you talk about these groups and people are like, oh, I would never. No, everybody is success is susceptible to a high controlled organization. Oh yeah, at some point because we all have those vulnerable moments, you know, and where we can't possibly save ourselves, we need this, you know, David Koresh to save us. We need this whatever this, you know, and that's where we get in these situations, which then, which then you get in these groups and it causes even more trauma responses and mm-hmm. more psychological warfare. And, you know, and, and so, yeah, well, that's, I'm really glad you brought that up. Because- yeah, well, a good teacher, I think will always redirect your power back to yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's one way you can tell. So if you're going out and you're, you're getting involved in, in different groups and different communities, which is fine. I mean, you should, you yeah. know, you shouldn't have to like go through the process all alone. Right. Um, but your, 
the, for me anyways, the truest, the highest teachers, I mean, they might be telling you, giving you guidance, right? Do this, do this, do this. But in the end, it should point you back to yourself. It shouldn't point you to some uh, power outside of yourself to some to human, yeah, some human being that's going to, you know, say, that's funny. Yeah. you <laughs> save yourself in the end, you right. have teachers and stuff that help to redirect your energy. I think that's more than anything what they do. They help to redirect where your thinking is and, and to, you know, open up new ways of looking at yourself. But in the end, they're going to say, no, you, in the end, you got to save yourself that, that, this, that's not going to save you. Right. That's something that both you and Todd are really, really, really good at doing. Um, Mm Because we both know within every organization, there are bad apples. Like there are definitely in the yoga world, some bad apples out there that like being, you know, the the little leaders of their communes. But, um, But both you and Todd are really, really good at that with your students. Like you're giving your students tools Mm-hmm. through your teaching so that they can help themselves. Yeah. And it, it is not, you and Todd are so good about like not getting super involved in like your clients or your students' lives beyond what you're teaching them and having some boundaries. Like I'm not a therapist. I'm not a doctor. I'm not, mm-hmm. you know, I'm just here to, to help you with what I understand. And then you do with it as you will, because, you know, at the end of the day, the teacher can't do the work for you. You have to do the work. It's all about you. The teacher's job is to eventually not be needed, sadly. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So let's uh, go into everybody's been asking me to, ex- and, I, and again, because both Cindy and I live our lives in the yoga world, I think I forget anyway that people just don't have this exposure like we do. Um, because I was shocked at how many people wanted us to review me to review the chakra system. Because we talk about this all the time. And I was like, Oh, I guess, yeah, okay, I guess they don't teach that in Zumba. So <laughs> I guess we got to. So can you go over the these different and not just the chakras, any type of like energetic points in the body? Yeah, you know, Okay, what I would like to say, we'll get into this, the, I was thinking about this and, you know, the, the, the chakra system, it's, uh, um, sometimes it's the easiest reference point for us to come in and start to understand aspects of our energetic body. But one thing that I've uh, been learning uh, as, as I progress and which I wish that I also knew a little bit, um, earlier and it's kind of like the, it's you know we're talking about the anatomy of your spirit like right the, uh, the anatomy of your higher self i like that i'm going to use that when i take <laughs> classes i like that yeah so this is the anatomy of your higher self it act, the the first vehicle the smallest vehicle is actually the subatomic particle of your electrons that is the first vehicle of your spirit is the electrons within your body. And I was uh, reading too, just to to prepare a little bit about uh, for this talk, like how many electrons does a human body have? (laughs) And it was giving some mathematical, it was like seven times 10 to the 27th degree. And I'm like, what does that mean? (laughs) Just give me a number, just give me a hard number. (laughs) I'm like, that must be a lot. And it was like something like octillions. It was in the octillions range in an adult body. So we think about electrons, electricity. This is like energy that, you know. Well, it's your first. That's what electrons do. Yeah, they move. Electrons, they're they're a primary carrier of electricity in your body. Mm -hmm. And they move at the speed of light. And they're quantum. They're, they're, they're quantum. They kind of move at the speed of light between realms in a way. You know what I mean? If, yep. I don't know. You have to study quantum physics and all that. I don't know that much about that. But electrons are, are kind of part of your atoms are. But, you know, the electrons, too, are part so of that realm. The fact that so you think of it by yourself as being um, a vehicle, again, not just for this world, but also for your past incarnations mm-hmm. and um, all yeah, that, the yeah. it's the electrons, they move through those different realms. It's wild. It's so wild. It's so cool. So yeah. If you even just sit and meditate on all the electrons in your body, that that will start to open up something way bigger. It feels different. For instance, if you just sit and think, 
of electrons, electrons, you know, and that being the first point of your higher self versus going straight into the chakras. I mean, like feel that, like feel into that, feel into your electrons and then feel into your chakras. Yeah. That's your mantra, guys. Your mantra for the week is electron. Uh huh. It has a like it has a different sensation to it, right? So um, the electrons are the first point, and the understanding that about the anatomy of your spirit is that it goes on a subatomic level. I think will help you understand how big or how um, electrifying you actually are. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like how connected you truly are to um something magnificent divinity yeah that exactly goes, that, goes, that goes back to the clairs all these yeah. are, that's why you're able to see things that are beyond the veil is because your electronic particles are living within these different realms of reality even though your physical eyes might not see unless you are clairvoyant you know but but it's like that explains how that this is now scientifically possible that mm-hmm. we're able to to have a spiritual experience in this human life Mm-hmm. And we are spiritual beings having having a human experience. So exactly, I'm so glad you, think, you talked about that. Yeah, the, so the because the electrons, uh, um, uh, they have to make up every single element. Because you know you're made up mainly of carbon, of hydrogen, of nitrogen, and uh, of oxygen. Right? I think those are the four main ones, and all the electrons that are running through, and then that, that how all that is coming together. All those elements are coming together to form the more of your um, biomolecular structure, like your proteins and your DNA, you know, your, well, your cells and then the DNA within your cells and all the proteins and the fats. I mean, it is, you're nothing but a current of pure electricity. Um, and the, your, and then I would say, you know, work through your electrons and then through your electrons, like working through the, like feel into all those different elements within your body and then start to feel within like your DNA structure because your DNA, because of all that is also the memory of everything. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you can start to but see that's, that's more of a refinement. If you think of the chakras, the chakras are a little bit more dense than that. Right. When we're talking on the level of molecular structure, there's a high speed frequency to it. Yeah. It will just blow you right open. Almost, yeah, I feel it almost immediately just talking about it. Like everything starts to tingle in your body, not just your chakras, but everything. So everything, you yeah. Alive with electricity. And yeah. that is the realm of your higher self. Your higher self is beyond your energy system. Right. Your whole entire body is filled with it and it's um your your body then is literally a light body it's an energetic light like l-i-g-h-t light body with uh sacred geometry yeah all yeah. that stuff within it you, you know, know what i mean it's like you are like the sacred geometric uh jewel with right. all these different facets. Like if you think of a jewel or a diamond, it has all these different facets, faces, and the way we then reflect and project light, that's very individual to us, depending on how our sacred geometry is cut, I guess you can say, or formed. Right. So you just know. think of yourself as electrons, as a, a light body, a sacred geometry vessel of pure energy and kajillions and kajillions of little energetic things moving, then I think that will really tune you into the essence of your higher self. Right. Then you can use like your chakra systems for like, if you get stuck somewhere. Right. But I think if you go straight to that geometry and to the electrons, it will, it will blow things open almost automatically at least for me well that makes sense because i was telling you you know i'm very familiar with the chakra system just for how many years i've been in yoga but within my actual line lineage of yoga we don't talk about the chakras that much yes i sometimes bring it up in class sometimes especially in this area of the body but mm-hmm. um, and the reason for that is from what i understand is that 
when somebody doesn't have the basis of understanding energetic body, they tend to make things worse by focusing on one specific chakra instead of understanding that they all work and one exactly. whole. You know, yeah, so, so I think if you understand that your whole entire body is working as a whole first, yeah, then you can start to work into like the other parts of the systems without tearing yourself apart. Right. You know what I mean? Because right. in the end, your higher self, if that's what you're really wanting to connect with, your higher self is just pure light that, you know, energies, again, this just geom beautiful, crystalline, geometric shapes that is fully illuminated. It can be different colors. Maybe it's gold, maybe it's white, maybe it's all these different colors. And yes. that will give you that sense of expansiveness from the get go. Right. That's kind of like I think a lot of times for us to work from that place can be more helpful than working, going straight to something that feels kind of small. Yeah. Get big first. And then, then work let down. That, let that bigness show you where you need to go next instead of letting your mind tell you where you need to go. Like connect with the bigness. Does this make sense? Like connect yeah. with your higher self, connect with that sacred, connect with that and let that tell you where you need to go. It's interesting because it kind of like, you know, in the Ashtanga practice we do, or we did now in the new system, they don't teach us, but I still teach this as, as you know, the Tadak Mudra, which we do it right before closing, um, where it's literally uh, where you kind of squeeze your body. I'm trying to explain it to people who don't practice. You're laying on the ground and you pull everything and you squeeze your legs together. It's a neutral, it's to neutralize your energy before you then go upside down. But they always say to think of like a swirl coming all the way up from your head to your toes. So it's like mm -hmm. you're focusing on this moving, living, breathing energy, just cleansing and moving. And it, it literally will then physically pop your body back mm -hmm. into a, a more uh, conducive space. So then you can do inversions, but, but like, that's kind of, when you say that it's that kind of seems like a great place to kind of practice feeling that sensation of everything yes. just constantly swirling mm -hmm. and swirling in cycles around the body. Yeah. So you do kind of see that in the yoga practice, although the teachers might not talk about that that much, but you do kind of see this practice of physically using the body to then energetically feel what you physically can't really see. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, you know, yeah. uh, you know, there is a lot of talk about the chakra system and that they, you know, it's useful. Obviously there's meaning to working with them, but I think sometimes people, the way they work with them, just be, it can make you feel small or right. broken down, or I don't know. Um, where it is if you first really just think about who you are and what you're made of and what your higher self is, it's bigger than your chakra system. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what I mean? So it's like you connect with that first. And, and again, the chakra system is more, it's a little bit more dense, even though it's energetic and it's light, it's more dense than your like this, you know, the hugeness of just being pure electricity. Right. Yeah. And again, it comes and back then, to like then the electricity can filter through your, your chakra system. Right. And it's kind of like with the, the different chakra points, like I said, a lot of teachers, especially when they're just coming out of like teacher training and they don't have that much experience, will do things that will focus on like one specifically. And that can generate more problems because as in everything, it works together. And I felt like the more I focused in my own practice on literally working on the body as a whole, then places I felt weak within like the chakra system got stronger. Mm -hmm. Because they all work, they don't work independent of each other. Even though they have independent purposes, they work together as one cohesive unit. Absolutely. And sometimes we think that the, the lower chakras, let's say the first, the second, the third, mm -hmm. your, your first chakra is your muldahara and it's tied to your root, feeling safe. But it's uh, anything that uh, makes you feel feel safe, like you belong and make you feel secure. Like money issues are usually tied to, to the Muldahara. That's your root. Then you, you got the one that, that comes right above that, your sacral chakra. 
and it's the color is yellow and that's your the the space of like sexuality sacred sexuality emotions you know having the right to feel mm-hmm. and then you got your third which is at, at your solar plexus your manipura it's yellow and that's your place of like feeling powerful right but the the first the bottom three you know sometimes two in the spiritual world just depending on on um um, what groups that you travel in, they'll put these bottom three as somehow being less than. Yeah. Because we should be trying to transcend and come up here to the, to the pineal or, and, you know, to our connection with heaven and to God and all that. But if your roots are off, it, it doesn't flow is this is the, the bottom three mm-hmm. are the foundation, but also the bottom three is the most taboo and where yeah. we hold the most amount of shame. Absolutely. Um, so uh, in, in the spiritual awakening process, it will often require us to actually descend first before we ascend. It's like, you need, to descend. you need to come down to your roots, get, get muddy, get, get icky, get into um, what the energy holds within the, the place of like the earth, the right. earth grounding and, and what it needs to be to feel safe in your humanity. Like your first three are very much tied to the sense of feeling human, your instincts, your yeah. primal instincts. And um, we're often taught that our primal instincts are bad. They're not bad. They're part of you. They're part of, of what makes you human. Right. And so we, when we can begin to honor it and integrate the fact of that, I want to feel safe. Mm-hmm. Like I want to have money in my bank account because that makes me feel safe. Yeah, I, I can want, eat it. Yeah, know, I want um, uh, really. I want people to love me. I want people. I want people to like me. Mm-hmm. It's actually okay to say that you want people to like you because that's actually a very primal response when you think about the people who came way before us the Neanderthals or you know like the, uh, when they were really in tribes if you were left alone you wouldn't you survive died. you yeah, wouldn't survive so we're that's that's people. why we're we're tribal people yeah and that's in your moldahara so it is important for your psyche to have people like you and that's right. okay. Because you know, right now the trend is like, oh, who cares what people think? And, and not that you should care what people think, but it is important for your, your well being for people to like you. And that's okay. And to be a it's friend, okay to want community. people yeah. to like you and to have, have a community <laughs> and to have friends and to fit in because that, satisfy, that satisfies that part of your, your primal instinct for survival as a human being because you're, you're human. Too. Yeah. You're not just spiritual, you're human. And yeah. That's what your human uh, component needs. And your human component also needs to feel emotions. And that's another thing that, that gets uh, squashed down. That's your sacral. Now we're talking about your, your, um, your sacral chakra. Which is, or it's, it's red, orange, yellow. That's the It's t- red. Yeah, then the orange, your sacral, your womb. You think of the yeah. womb space for women or your, or your reproductive organs are um the soft kind of fleshy part of your belly mm-hmm. um, where you feel emotion your hips can feed it into that as well yeah and the element that's tied to your your sacral chakra or your your second chakra your womb space is fluidity and water and water right. is directly tied to your emotions so um having a right to your feelings yeah. And that's another, it's a primal, it's a more instinctual response. Cause if we don't have, if we don't feel, if we don't feel safe to feel, then we're not safe. Yeah. And everything kind of shuts down, but then, but if we're not safe, period, like in other words, if we're in, in danger and we're, um, we're in true survival mode, then your feeling won't feel either. Do you see right. what I mean? So your yeah. root chakra sense of foundation and safety then it establishes the, the foundation to yeah. feel because right. you will feel like it's safe to feel. And then that feeds it into your power, which is your solar plexus. Mm-hmm. 
and um, empowerment sometimes is, is something that's not always, I mean, I know we're talking, we talk about it more these days, but feeling powerful, because sometimes we think of, of people who are powerful, and we think of people who always just take all the time, or they're greedy, or they're, 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 they're taking, 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 like that kind of power. Yeah, but that's not, wait, that's not the power of the, that's not the third chakra power. That's right. Like standing I mean, in your, in who you are. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah. But that's why those three specifically can really get ignored. Yeah, or kind of shut down or suppressed because, um, you know, they are more, they more linked to our humanity. And yeah. in the spiritual realm, we're trying to, you know, sometimes we think that squashing our humanity is what we should do. Y'all are right. <laughs> so, so not grounded. They like fly in the sky. No part of, I will tell you, I know Cindy, I know you know this, we've been doing this for a long time. The, the, the people that are the most, uh, I believe are the most like it, it, getting the most advanced in their, their own practice are, are very grounded. They're very yes. grounded. They're very human. They're very normal. They don't have, what is it? Ram Dass called it spiritual materialism where they wear like 50,000 ball of beads and like, walk around going it's so cool man no people who are really usually know when they're mad know when they're upset they they experience the human because that's that's why if you were not supposed to learn from being a human the universe would not have made you a human <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly so exactly and as far as like wanting friends that goes back to the beginning with trauma response and intuition wanting friends when you have a healthy understanding of your intuition you won't get into relationships that are trauma based when it comes to wanting people to like you. Mm -hmm. You'll understand, you'll have those healthy boundaries where they're, you want people to like you who are also going to have healthy boundaries with you. Yes. So it kind of goes back to that as well. And then just accepting anybody to be your friend, whether they're manipulative or not, isn't also yes. a sign of an imbalance there. Right. So, mm -hmm. so that I think goes back to the beginning with the intuition versus the trauma response and fear. Um, so I know people talk about this as being like your, your own sunshine as well. The solar plex is where the heat yes. comes from in your body, where the power shines through. And then you get to the heart. That's green, right? Am I correct in saying yes, that? Yes, green. And the, when you, your bottom three feel more so solid and stable and, um, I don't know, just, you know, like you feel comfortable in your own skin, let's yes. say, which is so much of what the first three chakras are about. Again, it's about descending. Those right. are three. It's about like kind of coming down, descending, putting your feet into the earth, accepting this earthly incarnation. I'll say that too, real quick, especially for star seeds. Some people might relate to the word star seeds. In other words, you feel like you're part of your soul, your spirit belongs in another planet somewhere, like you come from another star system. At this point, I think we all want to go to a different planet, but <laughs> I know. But then, and, and then we have this resistance to coming into human form because we feel like, oh, you know, this, this, this planet and this body is kind of heavy mm -hmm. more than what I'm used to. And there's all of this kind of this pain and suffering, all these different emotions that I'm just not used to. So let me get the hell out of here. So we, we shoot up out of our body. But part of the, again, the ascending process is to descend. You need to come down first and understand the importance of being in your form and like honoring that and, and seeing it as a sacred experience within itself. I love that. Yeah. Then, yes. Yeah, so then you can, uh, the heart space is uh, um, so much of goodness. I mean, that's the, the center of love, mm -hmm. not just the uh, love that we give out to other people, but our love toward ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the, when you work with the energy of love, that's a very, very powerful tool. That's a very powerful energy. However, if our heart is kind of closed down or shut down because we've shut ourselves down to, to the energy or the frequency of love, because of the things that we might have gone through, um, it becomes like harder to access. And we feel like we're depleted. And when we feel depleted in the heart, then we feel like we need to take. Right. Like, then we feel like I don't feel full enough. So then your the energy of your heart becomes like this energy. And not to say that you shouldn't have some of that, but there, it, should, it should be it's going out, it should be flowing in and out, in and out both ways. That's when it's right. like, you want to be able to receive. Absolutely. But there's a difference between just being open to receiving versus feeling so uh, closed off 
that you feel like you have to take right to receive. Yeah. You see what I mean the, Absolutely. the difference between those and two. When we say when we use the word love, we we again we have this romantic idea of like just always giving so much to everybody else and just just always but it's also self-love to the point where again you know boundaries. Again you know how yes. to Stand in your own power and not let mm-hmm. people manipulate you. That that is a form of self love as well. And I know it's interesting because I know Cindy's experiences with back bending with people in yoga when they're having to really open this area. People, that is where you really see people having a, a strong visceral reaction to the feeling here. You'll even hear people like pop when they start to really open this area physically because you do see that happening with people when they hunch down. Yes, um, you know their shoulders slump over that area, and it's like this this, this you hear the sensations, you know, and, and for yoga, we know like all disciplines of yoga that I'm aware of, you have to walk through. Yeah. You know, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Like you, it is not, it, you do not start off with love and light. That is many no, as lo- it is darkness I mean, and turmoil. You have to go first. through the muck. You mm-hmm. have to go through your own dark soul, through the own places where you suffer in your mind, your con the constructs. And that's what, you know, the whole yoga, if you look through the, you know, speaking of yoga, the yoga sutras of Patanjali, mm-hmm. it's all about the mind. Yeah. He's saying, okay, you need to get your mind under control because that's causing all the problems. <laughs> no, I love that. <laughs> so, I love that. Like a dude wrote this, 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 this book like 5,000 years ago or something. He's literally like, it's like the self, it's like, you're your own problem. Like, <laughs> what he's saying. He was like, you're, all this suffering that's on you that's on you boo like, that's basically what he's saying so um so then we move up to the throat the throat area uh, yeah, i love this uh, um this one always resonates the most with me because this was a big um point for me to be had to have to open up this was where this is where i close off is in my throat so i have a, a personal connection with the, the empowering yourself also through your throat and your communication mm-hmm. and being able to express truth and to unsuffocate your voice, right? Your voice can become small or suffocated because also all these other ones, they're, 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 if they're not flowing or function or, or things are stuck within your body, the, it's hard to then like communicate your truth because you don't even know what your truth is. So it's like, yeah. oh, you can't even say it right. Just you know what I mean? Right at that point. I heard somebody say too, it's like you see it with people when they've been, especially for women, we've been taught like, don't, you know, say anything, you know, kind of be, be very, you know, in the South, you have to be this proper Southern lady. Mm-hmm. You see people in their jaws where they get real locked jaw. And it's yeah. almost like they're taking it on the chin. You know, because they're 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 holding themselves back. Yeah, they're and they don't even and that's subconscious too. They don't even realize how they much they uh, deeply programmed themselves to be quiet. Yeah, no, because yeah. if you speak your truth or if you say something that's out of line, same kind of a thing. You know, you'll you'll probably get punished for it or um, no one will like you. You'll say the wrong things. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, you look and stupid. Then- yeah. Right. But when we can start to bring the, our throat down into our hearts, like the energy of the throat to anchor it into your heart, then you can start to speak from more of that authentic place within you instead of always. Well, another interesting thing about the throat is that it, it's the gateway between your head and your the rest of you the head and your heart and the rest of you. And I think that's interesting how, why is it that your throat is the gateway from so your, interesting. your heart? I mean, I'm, yeah. Why were, we, yeah. why were we made that way? You know, for us to be here right now talking about what it's like to be. <laughs> exactly. Well, and, I, and I will say too, I know for me, when I started doing YouTube and I still deal with this when days, when I have multiple recordings, my throat is very, very sore from talking so much. So it's not just not speaking. Sometimes there can be a dysfunction when you're speaking too much, when you're just, you know, and um, that's a trauma response to people who, because they, that's a, that's a stress response. Well, Um, yeah, I'm glad you said that because your, your chakras, they can hold deficiencies and they can hold excess. mm -hmm. Either way is an imbalance, right? Well, if you have an excess, of throat chakra and a lot of times an excess happens because there's a deficiency somewhere else and it's trying to make up for itself. Yep. Um, and someone with an excess throat chakra, yeah, they, they do. They talk a lot. They talk a lot. And, but if you've ever been around someone who's like that, you, 
there's not much power in their voice necessarily. And the per people who are listening won't gravitate to what they're saying because there's actually no true energetic power in their voice. It's more like this diarrhea of the mouth that's happening. Yeah. And they're harder to listen to mm -hmm. because there's no good, strong energetic structure that's coming out of their sound. That's a good um, point. Yeah. You know what I mean? And this is too a power, especially right here of it's a power of manifestation. Your voice is a power of manifestation. When you're, you're talking about like manifesting or magic or anything like that, it starts with a frequency. Well, I mean, it begins in thoughts too, but it comes the words you speak hold vibration and they, they're almost like, it, it's um, magnetic. It's spe well, we, we call it spelling for a reason. They're yeah, spelling. That's, yeah, that's the spell. Yeah, yeah. it's magnetic. You can, um, ca yeah, it's cast spelling, mm -hmm. casting spells. Yeah. You, that's why whenever in, in the realm of the occult, someone's casting spells, you say it out loud. Right. Because there's an understanding of the power of your voice. But then again, you got to build that and you got to reclaim that. If there is no power there or if you've shut it down or maybe the, your voice is more connected to your fears or your insecurities and all that, then you're going to manifest more of that. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So it's like you got to really connect to the power of your voice to your higher, let surrender your voice to your higher self instead of to your smaller self and you'll get much bigger, brighter results. And I will say that because I think that's a huge one that people can first start to identify with. And especially if you guys feel like your jaw getting tight at night or something, just connecting into that. So let, this is now the next one is my favorite one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's everyone's favorite one, though, who's in a, the spiritual world. So I'm move up to the next one. Yes, your pineal gland, your, your third, uh, your third eye. Its color is like this beautiful indigo color, mm -hmm. and it is tied right there to your pineal gland. Mm -hmm. And it is to be able, um, I mean, it is tied to an intuition in a sense, maybe like more for clear seeing. Your intuition, like your gut feeling, that's more in your gut. Yeah. But this is to perceive correctly. Yeah. More than anything is that when you're, you're seeing, that and that's that's a big thing with with Patanjali. That was what he wanted you to do mm -hmm. in the Yoga Sutras. He basically just wanted you to clear all your muck out so that you could see and perceive clearly. Uh, yeah, the, you and then you can make the better decisions for yourself. Yep. And that is an important aspect, like just as far as like human function of the pipe, besides being able to woo, like see things, but just like the. The, the function of how it can really help you. That's what Todd says all the time. The point of yoga, Todd's my boyfriend, guys. He, he, he was Tommy Joyce's student. He says the point of yoga is to be able to see the truth through yes. the illusion. Yeah, exactly. And that's this. Yeah. Yeah. And that is also in a lot of different cultures. They believe that this is where the soul enters and exits the body as well. And so mm -hmm. you have this special place. And I know if you like press it, there's like a, a point there you can press if you have a headache or something that can kind of, you know, um, but this is a very, and I actually, and this is not part of the Ashtanga system I teach, but usually after people go up in their final uh, headstand inversion and they're in like a child's position, I'll have students like focus on kind of pressing there a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. onto their mat. And, and because this is such a, a very yes. physical place. And a very energetic place as well. And that, of course, connects to your crown. Yes. And this is your connection. It's color. Some people have it is it depends. Uh, sometimes it's depicted as a violet color, but sometimes it's just like golden white. Yeah. Light. And your your sahasrara. It's your your I think it's the thousand petaled lotus flower at the crown of your yeah. head yeah and this is your wisdom your knowledge and, and your understanding and connection with spirit yeah like that, you know and the, um the baby be able body. to trust in something bigger than yourself mm -hmm. but then how it feeds back in to you so that you can make good wise decisions 
the excess of a now in the spiritual world we are a lot focused we're up here and right. we don't always necessarily like to yeah be here, these, like I said, these are the here. fun ones and so then you <laughs> be like oh ooh, and, up yeah. here and ungrounded but the excess of the crown chakra it's pretty those are serious things i mean they're, they're things like migraines mm -hmm. and again not wanting to be connected with the rest of the world uh delusions schizophrenia mm -hmm. things like that are the dysfunctions so they're big they're mental mind dysfunctions that come from here and here if we don't allow the, the chakra system or the, you know, the systems, the energetic systems in our body to work together. That's so. interesting. I, Tamara was saying how, um, and I know we all know this, that they, the powers that be like mess with our food, they put stuff into our food. That's not good. And it kind of calcifies our pineal gland. And when they started doing that, we started to see a rise in like mental disorders, mm -hmm. anxiety, depression, schizophrenia yes. we started to see this rise because we we know the side effects of all the stuff they put in our foods now is causing very physical things to happen like calcification of the pineal gland and now talking about the imbalance that's actually we're seeing that playing out in our world because it has mm -hmm. we're seeing children being diagnosed with stuff that they sh really shouldn't be diagnosed with at their young ages and stuff like that and so that's super interesting you said that it's almost like they know <laughs> they, they, yeah i mean they they kind yeah. of know how to put how to shut you down or to suppress yeah. you yeah um, you can also do uh, one of my little favorite meditations to do and then they do it they, um uh and it's a very common yogic thing to do but if you close you can do it with your eyes closed or with your eyes open but you take your eyes and you focus it on your pineal gland Mm -hmm. It is, you don't even have to do it long, but in just uh, depending on the, how well it's developed, sometimes you will start to see like crazy colors and mm -hmm. the sacred geometry and all this, this stuff that's, um, that's available to you that we don't often see because it is like calcified or closed off. And yeah, um, yeah we don't see what's actually in front of us. Yeah. See the truth, which the truth is beyond just our five senses too. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like being able to perceive um, the, I don't know, just how alive everything really is. This is going to sound, guys, I'm not, I'm not suggesting you all go home and do this. I'm just using this as an example, but people who participate in like magic mushrooms, mm -hmm. they see, they're able to then open up a part where they're seeing vibrations. They're seeing things coming off of the, off of the plants. Again, this is not me telling you guys to do this. This is just an example, but, um, but yeah, they can all of a sudden see stuff and we do. And in Ashwanga, especially we have like nine different vocal, uh, uh, focal points and you do start to practice being able to actually move the eyes around. And one of them is looking up and, and being mm -hmm. able to kind of work out, exercise your eyes in a way to be able to see beyond the world that is where we see, see already. And we talked about this on Sunday. We we're taught we have five senses, but our ancient ancestors were taught 10 senses. And I know obviously intuition is one going to the bathroom is one. I can't remember all of them, but there, there is more than five senses that we have mm -hmm. been kind of chipping back and taking that away. And so it's so, and I do think, and I know Cindy, we've talked about this. We're going into the age of Aquarius into a different timeline. And I'm seeing such a huge influx of people wanting to understand this. Will you tell my audience your, where they can find you? I'm going to place all of Cindy's links in the description box below as well. And what upcoming workshops or seminars that you have coming that they, if they were interested in coming and learning more from you. Well, of course I do yoga. This is actually the space. Yep. I'm actually in the yoga studio right now. This is the <laughs> space that we do it in. And um, most of the classes right now, not all of them, but most of the classes are run hybrid. Um, so we offer them Zoom and in studio. But when I teach the, the, the classes, I, it's important to understand the, the movement of the body, like why you're moving the body. It's not just for exercise. It is, but you have to understand now that your, your body is a sacred vessel for the divine. Your body and your mind are sacred vessels for that higher, deeper intelligence. And if your body is clogged up, then you, it will be difficult to, 
tune into the the voice or the connections of your your intuition so it's unclogging the body and working this the central nervous system that's a, another piece about when we're talking about being able to tell the difference between an intuition and fear a way for you to work uh better toward that is clear your central nervous system yeah okay because if your your central nervous system if it's very easily triggered then um, it's, it's going to play on your fears a lot more. Absolutely. Okay, so, so things like uh, when you hear things of like yoga or just moving the body, it's, it's, that's why it's also a spiritual practice because your body is a sacred vessel. Your mind is a sacred vessel. Right. But it's these are some of the things that I talk about too when I teach class. Because sometimes you're like, oh, yoga, I don't want to stretch. <laughs> no, y'all, we're not making pretty postures. Spiritual, and how's that helping yeah. me with anything when I stretch the body? But you got to understand that your body is an Akashic record. Mm -hmm. You're and opening up like different, almost like portals, like come bayous pathways that are giving you information. It honestly, guys, these pretty yoga postures aren't just for shits and giggles for Instagram. <laughs> they're, not, they're not. And sometimes they'll cause you to break down. You don't yep. know why. You start crying. You're like, what's happening to me? <laughs> most of the time myself included i'm sure cindy included the practice isn't pretty like you see on instagram it can be quite actually ugly yoga is sometimes the, the most powerful yoga because mm -hmm. that's when you're really digging deep and it takes a while to really understand the function so yeah and the good thing about hybrid if those who are watching that don't live in the state of georgia or don't live close you can sign up for Cindy's classes online and take her and take her classes via Zoom. Just make sure that you're looking at the time zone because we are on the East Coast. We're on Eastern Standard Time. Mm -hmm. So it matches your time zone because then you can actually take a class with Cindy. Um, if you live in California or Canada or in another country, you can actually sign up and take one. Yeah. So, so that is one thing, you know, the, the yoga, that's probably the most basic entry level to, to uh, what I do. And then if you want to delve deeper, I'm also an energy practitioner. And I, because, you know, we're talking about intuition again, I'm a, I'm a feeler, I'm a knower. Mm -hmm. And since I've been working with bodies for so long, cause I've been teaching yoga for a long period of time. I've also uh, received, you know, Reiki masters and then shamanic mm -hmm. healing practices. I'm from Peru, by the way. So I have a very strong, lineage to my my Andean roots. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of shamanic practices that I include with um, working with people individually to try to untap what's in the in the subconscious. And I've worked with her guys. She's good. I've worked with her. She's good. <laughs> She's good. So. It's like I go for me specifically, I like to go through the body mm -hmm. because uh, I love the body. So I'll go through the body and I can do it. Um, zoom too. I usually go through my body to go through your body because I am a feeler. It's like I'll feel in I'll feel into my body to feel into your body. Um, but anyways, then through there we can find if there's any like fragments so uh, or psych fragments, places that we want to pull back in, make you whole. And again that's that's all part of the awakening process. So I do individual work like that with, with people who just need some, because we all need some help because we don't know what's subconscious. You know what I mean? That's right. why, that's the reason it's subconscious. Yeah, we have no we idea what's there. <laughs> we know, it's like that junk drawer we never opened. Conscious, we, would, we would know it, but it's the subconscious stuff that, that really causes all sorts of havoc within, yeah. within your bodies. Um, so yeah. Uh, I can go in and, and do that kind of work individually. And then I am running a, a program that I'm starting August 21st, but this is more for in-house and it's very limited, but this is like kind of the things that I like to do. Um, it's called Ascension and I work with the archetypes of different, I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, I have a love for the, the different God, the archetypes of the goddesses like Isis and Mother Magdalene and even Mother Mary and Kali, even Medusa, she's like sacred yeah. rage. But anyway, it's working through the archetypes to help us with the ascension. That's the name of the course is ascension. But it's, it's the same kind of thing that we were talking about. We have to go through our body and recognize that we are holy vessels. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that, uh, again, that's limited to six people. It's only going to be in a house. 
Um, but that's starting in August 21st. If there's, and I'll put that down below, guys, because if you do live nearby, mm -hmm. you do want to come and participate. And again, I know you said Sunday to me off camera that you you want it to be an intimate group. And so for yes, people that because we I do initiations too, like yeah. the, the goddess archetypes will come in. I'm just I'm like just a channel, a vessel for their energy. They'll come in and work through. And when I do healing sessions or uh, energetic healing sessions, same thing kind of happens. Sometimes Mother Mary will come in for someone who needs some of that loving mother work, she'll come in and help to, to do, um, to do the work that you need to do. Sweet. So, <laughs> uh, well, yeah. and for people who may be a little bit hesitant, like that fear is coming up as we talked about it being in a vulnerable place. I will tell you with Cindy, she's the safest person for you to work with. She keeps everything. It's very private. And if you do one-on-one -on -one healing, it is obviously with just you and Cindy and nothing that comes out ever leaves the room ever. Mm -hmm. um, that would, as professionals, that would, that's part of our, our assignment yeah. is to keep it very private. And if you want to do the group setting because she wants it to be small, then you wouldn't be in a huge group of people. It'd be a very small group of, of women. It's just women you're working with or is not it? Not necessarily. It's not okay. always them. Even though we're working with the uh, female archetypes, they work with men, men as well. Women. Yeah. Men yeah. Just, I mean, men need the love just as much as the women do as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, we, I, I have a friend, I'll say uh, Janine, she reads tarot cards and, um, she talks a lot about the goddess energy as well. And for, I have to say, Mr. T, because we can't say his name on, on um, YouTube. But when she pulls his card, it's always the goddess card. Because yeah. even as alpha as he is, he has a feminine, like there's a feminine energy to him. So yes, men and women do carry both the elements of feminine oh, and masculine. Absolutely. And maybe in the West, we're kind of disconnected from that. But that doesn't mean if you're an alpha male, it doesn't mean that you can't tap into the softness of a female or female female. You can't have the alpha from time, you know, it's, it, it's a flowing ebb, ebb, and, ebb and flow of energy. So yeah, absolutely. So, and you also have a YouTube channel that you started. I just now, I just now resurrected it though. I have a whole <laughs> two brand new videos on there. And I, I'll link yeah, it below and I'll send you this like, as well. Sacred Garden, Sacred Garden Yoga is the name of the YouTube channel. I'll put that it's below guys. A little so. small, and, but yes, I plan on <laughs> I plan on adding, adding more to it for sure. And I'll, I'll send you this too as well. But yeah, guys. So, so if you follow Cindy on Instagram as well, she's constantly, she's way more active on her Instagram than I am, but she's constantly posting like beautiful things, kind of like daily things to think about, to kind of meditate on. And so I will share her Instagram as well. So you can kind of follow along and get these little nuggets of information. So, and if you guys have any questions, you can always message me as well because Cindy is the guest on this channel that I'm friends with in real life. I know, <laughs> yay. <laughs> in this world, in this YouTube world, all of my YouTube friends, I feel like I know them in real life, but we haven't had a chance to hang out in real life. But believe it or not, I knew Cindy long before I did YouTube. So. I, I know. <laughs> so, so yes. I... I can vouch for her. If you have any questions, you can always ask me too, because I can put you in contact with Cindy as well. So, um, well, thank you, Cindy. I'm so happy you got to do this today. I know, I know everybody's gonna be so excited because this has been one of the most requested topics out of all the topics that this has been so requested. So I appreciate Yay, you coming well, on. It's so here. much fun. I know. I love well, talking about this stuff. So yeah. I know I'm, I'm a nerd too. And it comes, <laughs> um, I don't think that people, cause I'm always like talking about like weird stories, French topics, you know, truth or yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. But this is the other side of it. This is the other side of the things that I love too, is like talking about this energetic body and this, what, who are we really? And, you know, of course, everybody knows in my in real life job is yoga. So, so I'm so happy that I got to have you come back on again. We'll have you come back on again as well to do some follow-up stuff. So yeah, in fact, I'm going to put out there right now, if there's anybody out there that has a specific question for Cindy, just like we do with Tamara and Tara by Janine, any specific questions you have for Cindy, um, send them in to me or put them in the comment section below, and then we'll schedule another time to, to cover those questions. would love it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much for you. inviting me to be here. <laughs> All right, guys. I'll see y'all later. Bye. Bye.